Thank you, Anzu. Thank you, Anzu, for your beautiful presentation. You're welcome. We, can, we saw, let's say, two very far edges of investment amount, and we can see that even in the most difficult situations, it's possible to, to make very lively spaces. I mean, the two, these two different, different contexts, they show us that it's possible to create, all, it's always possible to create nice spaces for having fun. So now I'm going to invite for, to sit here on the stage, Baha uh, Ezinsti, right? Did I pronounce right? Yeah. Baha is a planner and researcher at uh, Mimar Sinan, and she's actually working with her students on design guidelines for parents and children. Please, Elba, you please come back. Uh, Aish Orlandi, a professor at Kadir, and she has a PhD in product design at Mimar. And she recently ran a studio which is part of the initiative to establish a master's program by Urban 85. And finally, Alexandra Lange, she's an architecture, Alexander, an architecture critic, and she wrote a, the book called Design of Childhood, How the Material World Shape uh, Our Kids. So, is it working here? Yeah, right. So, I would like to, to bring them, uh, them into, the, into the conversation. So, I would like Bahar uh, to comment. Uh, I mean, we saw, let's say, two edges of the spectrum. And, and we see that both edges work. And you, you are working specifically on, on design guidelines. And we imagine also the difficulty, which is to, to establish uh, which, where do we stop? Until where we go? Which sort of guidelines uh, do we need? And so I would like you to, to comment a little bit on, on this presentation and how this refers also to, to this idea of uh, where should we, what should we reach, what should we establish, how it relates to, to this idea of uh, guidelines and for, for a okay. city. Difficult question. Actually, I mean, my play, playground is Istanbul, of course, I'm based in here, so I have a very difficult playground. So then it is very difficult to find a starting point, you know, because uh, Istanbul has many different uh, typologies in families, social areas, cultural areas, and of course, economic levels uh, differs between the, the neighborhoods. So uh, what I do is my with my students, uh, we do shadowing projects and observations uh, to see how parents or the caregivers deal with their kids and the city together, how they move around to see what city, what they are doing. So what we do is just uh, walking in the streets uh, or in based in parks and make long-term observations on the parents and the kids. But of course, I mean, when you are working in a, uh, in a neighborhood, they are the people who are living there. So your target group is mainly based there. But in Istanbul, there are many cases that there are uh, lots of children living in uh, gated communities, living, uh, studying in private schools, and they are moving in the city with cars or buses. So they, they have a different observation, uh, the perception of the city. So it's another case which we are not uh, focused on very much. But on the other hand, uh, affordances, is a, uh, affordances is a very, very, very important context for Istanbul because uh, most of the kids are not walking to their primary schools. They are taken by their parents or their cars. The only place that they uh, experience the city by walking is the, around the playgrounds or maybe the, the small streets in, in, in front of their houses. So it is something else when you try to find out some guidelines because the distance that they live is quite different than the whole city scale. Um, and the plays, the, the, the play that they are playing <laughs> or uh, the, the time how they are spend, spending in the street differs. So what we see mostly is the parents are so skeptic about the kids. So I think, first of all, I'm an urban planner, but I think we have to start with the parents. And we need to 
Um, how can I teach them? Educate them, yes. Convince them, <laughs> that was the word <laughs> I was looking for. We, we need to convince them, uh, convince them that their kids will be safe in the streets because there are also other people. Uh, okay, we need larger sidewalks, uh, better lighting maybe, or the zebra crossings uh, on the streets, but then even when we are just able to do this, they're going to be safe. Uh, and we need to let the, the children play on the streets, even though for that we don't have, need any guidelines actually, because when you have a small pond after the, ro the rain, I mean on the, on the sidewalk, all the kids can play and have fun and want to go out. They don't need specifically to these very fancy uh, playgrounds, every day at least. I mean, okay, they also want to go that beautiful playgrounds there and, and play there, but for not, not for every day. A, a minimum, minimum that allows life to, yeah. to flourish. Uh, in the, the city, city life, and just uh, I think the main uh, target is to invite all the people, not only the kids, but everyone to the to the public spaces, uh, which I find very very important. Uh, and in between uh, the the local authorities and the social initiatives, because local, I mean, in Istanbul case, local authorities have many things to do, say, so they cannot focus on each issues. So that's why I find it very important for NGOs to be on the streets trying to do something and uh, help people to understand their needs. And, and it's interesting because uh, if we think that, uh, we think about tactical urbanism and temporary intervention, they have a whole different set of guidelines which are they perform in a very short amount of time in order to create a connection between between people and the environment, right? Yeah, um, and when you see the results, it's actually really working. I mean, uh, when the people uh, are free to use their streets as they want, and they start to demand uh, afterwards. That's, I think, what we need, in, uh, especially in sub because if you don't demand, uh, usually you don't get what you need. So uh, these, uh, the, the aim, one of the aims was to make people aware of the, uh, their uh, abilities uh, to create uh, their own public spaces. Uh, yes, it can be out of standards, but still uh, you can make it work. So uh, that's what we experienced from our uh, so events. So I want to, to, to yeah. okay. So what is the follow up? On this project, when, when I missed when it was, was it this year or a couple of years different, back? Different years. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, we had to stop it. Uh, I think uh, four years ago. Yes, and we are uh, still questioning ourselves what should we do next because there are different opinions in our uh, group. Like maybe why not just uh, working in just one street? Uh, continuously uh, every month uh, to organize these events and change the streets uh, with the involvement of the residents, like participation of the residents to the change mm -hmm. process. My, my question actually was, yeah. are they picking it up? Picking it up, yeah. That, that means, are they afterwards mm -hmm. going to do this themselves? Or sure. are they waiting for you? They're usually waiting for us. So that's why we wanted to share this toolkit mm -hmm. for others, because we want them, okay, this is what we have done so far, but you can also do this. You all have the uh, ability to organize yourself. So uh, that was the uh, main reason of the toolkit. Uh, uh, we talked a little bit, and you are pretty much in the process of design and how how these things they they come together to an end. But but I have, I mean, you have a background. A, sorry, you have a PhD as a as product designer, right? And and I think one 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 important question is industry, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, when we see the the regular playgrounds around cities, they are just a replication of the same swingers, the same bouncers and uh, with very few variation and I, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering I mean what can we expect from them and is there a way to how to transform 
uh, the way that they, the kind of products that they, they offer, uh, if the, the new technologies of fabrication, they are, uh, it, it, they are already changing uh, those products? I mean, if you, if you could. Uh, um, well, I mean, the basic uh, principle and the driver of the industry is profit, basically. So, but I, I still believe that design has the power, of course, to bring up variety, but focusing on people. So, uh, most of the time what we see today is many of the municipalities also in Turkey and in Istanbul are, they're looking at catalogs, like catalog products, and what in the, you know, the old school of designing from the product design perspective, we always design the product and then series of products and then a catalog comes up and then what happens I believe in the urban design context is that you know there is this the location that's you know drawn the, the, the frame is drawn there and then it's like a you know just look at the plan and it's like a decoration that's looking from a playground equipment catalog. So there is no real intact uh, interaction with the user. I mean, the user is sometimes zero to three year old and then sometimes it's 12 year old uh, younger kids and it's most of the time also caregivers, caretakers. So um, what I do suggest is that I think designers, if they have the interdisciplinary approach of looking at the urban space, looking at observation from each height and you know, looking at the behavioral patterns of people from location to location. I mean, uh, we know that uh, some of the participants from different municipalities and we know that the interaction with the kids and the families are different on public space. So taking this into consideration needs a broader uh, vision from the designer perspective. So I think designers, either they're urban designers or product designers or uh, architects, they should look at it as the whole pattern of you know, human-centered activities. How the, the traffic flows of people or you know, at daytime, what is the, the density at daytime and what happens after six o'clock. So um, my, I, among my notes, uh, I have the keyword of transition mm -hmm. uh, from Alger's uh, project and his perspective. So this transitional uh, possibilities actually brings up the, the context of hybrid products and hybrid approaches. So in my neighborhood also, there's a very small, very like a regular and boring playground where there's a basketball field, which is used, my, I have a daughter who's six years old, but she, because on the street, she doesn't have a, a flat surface for uh, riding her bike or uh, her scooter. But what happens is that when the kids in the neighborhood don't play basketball in that field, all the kids are there just to, you know, use up all their uh, vehicles of each kind, you know, from all age groups. So I think the idea of this transition, uh, I wanted to ask, I think should, you know, bring up more, um, let's say, genuine approach or like, you know, research for a new language or a new way of new products and integrated perspective. Uh, do you think this kind of, you know, came up? in your experience of a long span of, you know, dealing with play, or you think there can be guidelines or we can just, I don't know, how can we say that this is something important to, to new young designers, let's say? May I just Sorry. want to think <laughs> a question to, to Elgar. Uh, bring back the question of industry. Okay. If, you, if, you, if you see a transformation of industry, and uh, the industry that supplies uh, equipment and that, that built that builds the, the, the parts in, I mean, if you see a transition, if you can identify or something that, I mean, it was always like that and since out of an eye, I don't know. Interesting thing is actually, I remember you mentioning Noguchi. Yeah. I cannot even do it better than he did. And um, the funny thing is that over the years, things have changed. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, many architects and artists were involved in playgrounds uh, in many different uh, ways. And somewhere this has changed. The industry came in, standards came in, and actually the standards are from that perspective actually a bad thing because the industry um, took that as saying you need, to, you need us because otherwise it's unsafe. And then the whole thing changed, and I noticed that play has become, in, in the general sense of the word, has become another important factor in many things. 
since 2000, maybe even before, and slowly this is trickling down again to the playground, strangely enough, where we um, see that we need to have a different approach, where we have the junkyard playground is the best playground there is, and the highest hill with a muddy slide is the best playground there is. Um, society goes in waves, mm -hmm. and so does the playground design. Okay, Alexandra, uh, you showed yesterday to us, I mean, uh, some of your findings on your book, and uh, I want to ask you something which connects uh, with Arzur presentation, which is, uh, was it possible to map uh, also, I mean, as you, I mean, I know that you look at specifically in, in how these play spaces they they evolved over time, but uh, but, but by looking at this, uh, could you do some findings on on how also well this word didn't exist before, but how tactical urbanism evolved over time? What what means? I mean, how other kinds of informal appropriation of space changed? Actually, I think. In a strange way, the informal the <laughs> informal appropriation of space has changed the least. I mean, I showed a picture of a play street from 1910 in New York City that doesn't look so different from the play streets that, that you just showed in your presentation. Um, you know, and, and Simon said earlier today, like, closing a street is really this incredibly powerful thing, and it and it. Um, evokes the most basic kind of play with, with the simplest possible materials. So that really, I, I mean, I think it's great because that really is step one. But I also think that designers who've made per permanent spaces um, can learn from that and have learned from that. And I was really glad that Elgar brought up Aldo Van Eyck. I mean, it's hard to design playgrounds in Amsterdam and not think of Aldo Van Eyck because I, I talk about him a lot in my book. He's really inspirational. And the thing that always gets an audience of designers is saying that he designed 700 playgrounds. That's the number I use. Because you know who, who among us can say that they made 700 of anything? And the way that he did that, I think, was by making a really, really simple kit of parts that's kind of one step up in permanence from the simple things that you can bring to a street. He has, you know, these kind of, I always call them concrete tuffets, and he has a sandbox, um, and he has these metal climbing hoops. So these things are permanent, but they also don't forestall other possibilities in that space. So it has that kind of double functioning, it has that kind of affordance, at, but it is permanent. It means that like, it can't, you know, it can't be taken back for cars, but it's still available really for all other uses. So I feel like, Van Eyck is still this model that if we're talking about guidelines, if we're talking about really simple playgrounds, like that's where we should be looking. Um, and, and the fact that he made 700 of them is an indication that like a, a city, like there was enough space in the city for that kind of play at that scale. And moreover, the reason why he did it, to build communities in the new modernist layout of Amsterdam, bringing people outside again, which is actually the same thing as we are discussing here. Yeah, and, and a lot of them were cited when people from one neighborhood saw that another neighborhood had gotten a playground and they wrote a letter to the night's boss, Jacoba Mulder, and said, we would like a playground. So it, you know, it was like a push and a pull from the city government. And so um, you know, that's how they appeared. Okay, the, the, the word community popped out at some of the presentations. Uh, and then I cannot not bring the question about public spaces because we, we, are, we are, I believe that all of us are advocators for, for the importance of keeping space public. But you showed, for example, in your presentation that you, you have a design in Istanbul. You said you know my work because uh, of this park that, uh, that, that's part of a, a, a private compound. So, so what, 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 what is the role? of private space in cities like Istanbul or like uh, Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro? And what are the risks associated? What are the benefits associated? I mean, how do you, uh, this is, let's say, a question for, for, no, it's not only for, it's for you, but I also want to have the, the voices of uh, Istanbul. Uh, I think it's important. 
May, may, may I start? Okay. I find this a very difficult question because it brings me in the position uh, when should a designer step in or when shouldn't he or she? And um, in the Netherlands, we actually don't have private public spaces, as you know, in many other parts in the world. So for me, that was strange and new. And I had to think about why should I do this? And um, then afterwards, I start realizing that in other parts of the world, probably in Brazil, but also in Asia, municipality has stepped out. They are not catering for these places anymore. So who am I to say that a private party, party should, not, should not step in and have this? I, I cannot say don't, because actually, this auto center works pretty well in that neighborhood, and it is a, a public space in that sense. Um, of course, there are conditions when you should say no, yes or no, but I don't want to judge on that. Okay. So maybe you can comment. I, I think, I mean, in my point of view, private public spaces are okay. I mean, it, we have this existence in our city scale, and it's a part of the city pattern right now. And I mean, we need to accept them, and we need to create a network. I think even, I mean including all these playgrounds, private playgrounds in it too. And because the municipalities also have some playgrounds, good or bad, I mean, we can discuss it. Some of them uh, are really eager to do good things, but they don't have good budgets, I mean, to work with the designers. But still, uh, they offer spaces. But Zorlo has a bigger budget and a different point of view. So they, I mean, have you, which is a very important, I mean, uh, thing for Istanbul, I think. So I. In an upper scale, I think we need to gather them all. I mean, like a playground in the city, we need to create a network with them. Not also in the spotting only in the playground, but also including the small streets, some of them that Arzu is working on. Or maybe in um, gardens of some primary schools, which are mostly closed in the, in the weekend. So I think this is what we need to focus on. I mean. Zor Playground is one of these parts of this network, but we need to create the network before. We need to, to have a vision. And also, I think we need a balance. We need a balance between private and public uh, yeah. spaces yeah. within the city, the proportion of the private and public spaces. Because uh, if saying, okay, uh, we, we don't have any uh, qualified public spaces, let's have these kind of private spaces, uh, if you say okay to this, and then it will pop up, pop and uh, you know, numbers of uh, these uh, spaces will uh, increase. So I think there should be a balance. Mm -hmm. uh, sh yeah, sometimes these kind of private uh, public spaces, especially for children, can uh, work, uh, but still we, I think we should demand for uh, public spaces which are accessible for all, all, all of the people. Bahar, you, you mentioned the word school, mm -hmm. and you mentioned the spaces that the schools have, mm -hmm. and the schools have. Uh, wh what's your vision about uh, the role that schools can play in, in the network of... Uh, in when, when I was in, in uh, primary school, I mean, okay, we had a... Uh, in, it, 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 my primary school is a very central point and dance point in Istanbul. It was a very nice garden. And it was it has very low um, walls, so everybody can access. But after a certain time, uh, they started to close the walls, so nobody can go inside. I mean, after the school closes, you cannot go inside the garden. <coughs> it's still right th today. It is still like this. But there are empty spaces, you know, <coughs> especially for the weekends when you take your kid out and try to find a space for the scooters or let them run or play whatever they like, they can use that space. But so there is a possible, built network of spaces which are not, not used, used yes, on weekend yes, when they are not there. But there's, there's a huge potential. There are parking spaces. Like there are parking right spaces. Right now, yeah. We did that in our city. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was this initiative when Bloomberg was the mayor to make sure every child is within you know, kind of 10 minutes of an open space, which mm -hmm. is a rubric that's often mentioned. And they basically opened all the schoolyards on weekends mm -hmm. to kind of solve their problem instantaneously. 
um, which has been great, and it's exactly like we use it for exactly that purpose of you know riding bikes and scooters. Um, but the great thing was that after the schoolyards were open on weekends, then people started to look at the schoolyards and say, well, okay, but this is just blacktop. You know, there's no trees here. It's open space, but it's not green space. So then a bunch of the schoolyards got trees. And a bunch of the schoolyards got additional facilities. So it was like the first step of just making them open was you know cheap to free. And then the next step was people started to see them um, as an opportunity and that you know, has brought more green space to more cities. So, I mean, it's it's a great it's a great thing to identify and then um, to see as a potential site. Yeah. In the Netherlands now to have all schoolyards, although we don't have yards, we have front yards. It's a different to keep them open. And it actually um, says what the book The Active City is a borderless spaces and one of the spaces that we use the portal spaces are these schoolyards so every schoolyard doesn't have a fence anymore and it works pretty well going back to the private and the public and the example of carp in the uh, zola center i think it's a good example because it also shows us you know good design cases can also teach communities that they can ask for higher quality uh, services like you know because we have been you know we we have the tendency to complain about you know how badly things are designed, but then you know hiring up a little bit the level of you know design sensitivity and design perception. I think we need to also uh, you know kind of provoke the market, you know, with examples that are not similar to the mainstream uh, catalog design uh, ambience. So I think th I, I see it as a potential and a quality that can add up. Uh, to the whole scene of, you know, playground and outdoor play equipment. So I think this is an opportunity uh, to learn from, to have a variety of things and a different perspective Break towards design, so that people start, you know, because we also have this, when we are t teaching design, we always say, you know, haven't you seen that, haven't you seen this? And then it's like, okay, now go and see it, and now let's discuss it, yeah. so that they can have a vision for th for their future, so that maybe we can have more, um, you know, questioning new generation of designers, so that they will start questioning the private and the public, and then you know the, the accessibility to, to good design. So I think I see it as an opportunity that the, the private uh, capital can you know bring in as a positive value to the so to the one discussion. One one last question be before we open to the audience, uh, Azur. Uh, but you can comment, please. Uh, Azul, I mean, you manage uh, public space temporarily. And I want to know uh, if, you have, if you know cases, uh, if you could mention cases of community management on public space. So spaces which are public, but they are managed by communities. Do you, you know any case, or in some one other city, or? to reclaim a green space in the neighborhood, very important uh, public space. It used to be a field, uh, kind of um, community, let's say, uh, leftover. leftover space. And they fight for it and uh, succeeded to turn it into a very uh, successful working community garden. And it was uh, a result of uh, collaboration between the neighbor neighborhood association and the municipality and also other supporters. And they didn't give up for a long time. I mean, for 20 years, uh, they stood up uh, and demanded that, okay, we don't want any, because it, that it was under threat of building a hospital in, in, instead of a green space. Um, so they, they asked, uh, okay, we need this space as green space and, and a social public space that we can all access and use actively. So I think that's one of the most successful examples in Istanbul. Right? The space was designed by the, the local neighborhood architects yeah. and designers. 
uh, I mean, not not maybe strongly participated but, but, uh, process, but uh, yeah, but it, it uh, the participation of the residents was a part of this uh, mm -hmm. process. So I think uh, the needs of the neighborhood, especially uh, the residents and children, were involved. So uh, that's one of the uh, good examples, I think. I'm very happy to hear this because this is initiative where programming by um, organizations should have a follow-up. That is actually the question that I wanted to ask you. Is there any follow-up? Is the initiative taken over by the community? Because otherwise, you can show them, but is it, if, if, if there's no follow-up, it doesn't make sense. But this is a perfect example of how it should be and how municipalities actually should be a little bit more flexible in assisting the, uh, with these initiatives. Uh, because uh, it will make their spaces not much nicer or better used. Of course, it's working very well. I mean, municipalities saw uh, that it was really su successful and then uh, started another uh, community garden uh, in, the, uh, in, in another neighborhood with the same design. So when you show them it's, uh, with the participation of the residents, it's a good uh, design and good solution yeah, and that is easier for uh, it's easier to convince municipalities to improve those kind of projects. That's great. But now we are going to to ask the audience for their questions, their comments. Okay. <laughs> there is the uh, okay. I'm a bit excited because I'm a student. Like there are so many planners and professionals, uh, it may sound a bit uh, raw to ask uh, my question. Uh, I'm an architecture student in ITU, uh, third year. We're working on a space for children in Karakuri, uh, considering the future uh, renovation or restoration projects uh, already going on. Some things are going on. Uh, my question is, uh, I see we mostly looking at the subject from a, a city planning perspective or policy creative perspective or uh, making people more conscious about how to approach things. But from an architectural view, uh, I don't think we can separate uh, the residential areas uh, directly from the uh, social socializing areas. Uh, playground somewhere and residency somewhere. But also, for example, we start making a uh, building a new uh, residency and we have a very limited space for playgrounds. So how do we associate residencies, uh, especially buildings, con concrete buildings with the playgrounds or uh, streets or like creating this transition between the buildings and the playgrounds also making maybe the buildings playgrounds? Uh, that's my question. Or is it addressed to someone? I like especially uh, Mr. Bills because I, I know he's an architect. Maybe like he can give a more architectural perspective if he can. Um, okay. Um, first of all, we need to question why isn't there enough space? But that's a financial question because we don't dedicate this space for uh, this public space. We only build. Um, I, uh, but, but then on the other end, um, I would say even if there is a little space, because that is what I was trying to say, you can do a lot. Sometimes uh, a small intervention uh, can actually uh, cause a lot. So, and there's always spaces in between buildings. So what is the minimum that you can do to um, to create what you actually want. I know for an example, we, somewhere we had a footprint of 15 square meters, so we thought, let's go up like the buildings uh, to create something. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the book, The Active City, there's another book called The Active Building, is also um, uh, for people actually to exercise in buildings. How can we make our buildings uh, for a healthy living? I can see playing being part of that. Um, we are used to using elevators and not using the stairs anymore, but uh, that's the simplest 
uh, example that I can give, but there's many opportunities um, to implement these things in, uh, in either buildings or small spaces uh, with, a, with a large result. You only need to persuade the people that are making these buildings. That is where the problem probably is. Okay, I think there is someone over there, right? Is there someone else? Ah, there also. Thank, uh, thank you. This is a question for Arzu. Um, I'm really interested to hear more about your model for the, the street is ours. So how long were the streets closed for? Um, uh, did you take the cars out from the streets? Did you program them? And the second part of the question is, is have you looked at other models for play streets from uh, other parts of the world? So for instance, I'm very familiar with the model from the UK which is a, a resident-led model. So you, you build in from the start that residents um, own the process. They decide that they want to close the street for an hour a week or an hour a month. The municipality sorts out the paperwork so that they can do that. Um, and then you have a model that's sustainable from the start because the municipality can say to all the other streets, here, uh, we now have a, have, a, have a process where you can apply as a group of residents and you can close your streets uh, within reason uh, uh, as much as you want. Um, of course we have uh, searched and inspired from different models and different examples from all around the world uh, about this Sunday, uh, car free Sundays and other uh, names. And the process was uh, not let's say, a bottom-up uh, that's coming from the residents. Because uh, first you have to give this idea uh, to the people that uh, this kind of thing uh, can work and you can have your street uh, without cars. I mean, if you ask people uh, if a car-free feature is possible, but, uh, most of the people would say no. So it's uh, very important to show people that for one day, uh, you can have this and it's, it can uh, be a model for uh, the future of your neighbor, neighborhood. So we wanted to actually trigger this idea. So we uh, went to municipalities first to explain our idea and uh, wanted to collaborate with them and choose the street together. And then we went to the street uh, and uh, at least a week ago uh, to get to know people and also uh, to inform that them about the event uh, and also ask them if they have a car, please uh, park it somewhere else nearby. So the process started like this and after we, whenever we um, organize this event, uh, the response are very positive, like, okay, we want to do this again, and what should we do? At that point, we want to uh, give them our uh, guide, our tool uh, kit, to, you know, trigger them to uh, organize their own event. That's, what's, that's our main purpose, but it, uh, so far, uh, it hasn't happened. But Maybe this could be the next step for our uh, project. There is a question there. Someone else? So that we know. Here. Uh, thank you. This is Narmin uh, from Stamatia University. I'm child development specialist and psychologist. Uh, I would love to ask, uh, actually, thank you uh, for your perfect uh, presentation. My question is about, uh, especially, you know, um, as a philosophical approach, um, children find themselves uh, in the eyes of their mothers or in the others. So uh, maybe my question is uh, can be about the uh, product design or urban uh, urban design. You know, children, how do they find themselves to the design? You know, as a, you know, in Turkey. Um, 
parts are so you know prototype has a prototype and um, not uh, will their confidence so uh, you know especially I want to uh, ask to make a comparison between Turkey and the other countries maybe Netherlands or uh, other cities um, how do they find themselves to the design or the plan or do they um, you know their per your perceptions thank you question actually and uh, if I look from it uh, from a certain perspective I would call the children the clients mm -hmm. they're the easiest clients there are mm -hmm. because they are not being withheld as we are so I have the easiest job in the world whatever I do they like it it's always the others mm -hmm. that are grown up that see the problems the constraints etc and I think that as soon as all parents leave the space and you put the children there, you leave them there, they will uh, make sure they have a good time. It, also in Turkey, that is, that's universal. That's what I think. I, I wish that the, the grown-ups uh, could start. That is why I also showed that image. We, we, we try to, to get rid of all conditions that make things impossible, all constraints, all parties in the beginning. Let's enter the design first naive and then we, we, we see how we achieve something. So uh, I like the question, but the answer is also simple in my, for my perspective. So, yes. And the lady over there. Um, I heard uh, um, in your presentations two things that are a bit um, opposite. You know, it's interesting. At one side, there's the, the the examples of doing like temporary things that are pop-ups or cheap and easy to make and replace. And it made me think about if you in in Istanbul, if you're talking about guidelines, if you're thinking about maybe giving more guidance that these processes are maybe encouraged but also a bit optimalized eh? because I think the problem might be in temporary cheap things is that they might just miss the effects or be not used to its high potential and that they then also could use designers to accompany that process and then maybe make a kind of hybrid thing between, okay, it's not a manual, but it might be something that is a bit more systematized. And I wanted to also ask your both opinions about that. Because it's also going again between participation and leadership from a designer, yeah, a single designer. Well, I think, uh, I can facilitate participation of residents for permanent design solutions. So I think that's the first step. And to take it further, yes, we need to work with uh, decision makers to sustain this uh, effect and also the, uh, I mean, to make it more uh, accessible for everybody. That's what I think. a slightly different <laughs> approach. Uh, there's nothing wrong with events, because you, you use it, but the events are actually meant to cause something. Uh, and then we come to the question, um, uh, where should the money be coming from? But there is small, there, there's a small amount of money already to do these kind of events. And I strongly believe that you don't need much to do something. And we did projects in Amsterdam where we had two times 1,500 euros, and they're still up. Um, I have to say that there was lots of man hours involved for people that wanted to, 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 to be part of that. That's where the problem is, but you don't need fancy playgrounds or fancy things. I strongly believe in that you start with the event, hopefully you there, there's a spark that is uh, ignited and brings together people that want to take over, and then the professional designer 
His job is actually the middleman, see how with the limited amount uh, that we have can, can build something that might be kept up for a longer period. Uh, one year, three years, five years, or maybe there's another spark coming from that, and so things can grow. But money, we don't uh, actually have uh, money. Without money, organize events, without so money you groups, have to uh, yeah. go uh, search for reuse materials. There's also yeah, sure. go to industries, and, and, and that, that's another uh, but, but approach. But Azul mentioned that uh, actually there was at least one street that became permanently closed. It closed, yeah, yeah. So so two of them are now uh, Palestinian. So Palestinian this is not temporary design. anymore. This is that, already permanent. Yeah, yeah that's perfect. permanent, yes. Yeah. The word guidance is much more uh, important than guidelines, actually, because when you say guidelines, it is, sounds like a more technical term, you know? It's like the urban designers or architects or local authorities, but, but when it comes to the guidelines, so it is for everyone who are interested in the subject, I mean, in the designers and I mean, any, anyone in the field. And I just want to ask a small question, maybe just following this. Uh, because I think guidance and also experience sharing is very, very important in our fields. I mean, because ours is a different uh, experience and you as a designer have a different perspective. So I was just wondering if you just worked with designers while closing these streets and maybe Elgar, if, if you design something for a non-profit organization, how, how was uh, the balance? <laughs> okay. Um, First of all, um, you need to know that what I'm working for is defining what I'm asking as mm -hmm. a designer. I find that very important because if you work for a non-profit organization, something else than working for the Zorbel Center. Um, I did a, a small project in Amsterdam where there was hardly any money and they invited a designer and of course there was a lot of rejection against that. Yeah, we don't want that. And uh, uh, so what I did, was uh, we just bought this uh, new 3D printer that we had to try out. And we printed all little small blocks uh, from uh, that you, uh, or, and pellets. Mm -hmm. And then we made a drawing. And I had a bag full of these small printed elements. I put them on the table and I said, well, OK, go ahead, design your own space. They, in the beginning, they were very enthusiastic. Then it started to become a conflict because everybody wanted to build something for themselves. Um, um, and after three days, they called me in and said, can you please assist me? Uh, it's not always like that, but of course, they, they, they don't want the designer tell them how they should design something, but then they realized that I could bring in my experience and they could bring in their experience and together we could create this project. I think this connects to, oh, to your, yeah, your findings. Anyway, <laughs> but those were adults, right? I feel like children <laughs> might have been able to create their own playground. Yeah, but they acted as uh, yeah. children. In no, no, but yeah, I, I think children are, are forced to do more conflict resolution like on a daily basis than most adults. Yeah, so maybe, maybe, but conflict is a good thing to achieve things. Yeah. There's yeah. one written about that. Yeah. <laughs> but I think design itself is just facing all the challenges, like your budgets, your possibilities, the environment, the limitations. It is, that's the, what design is all about. So I think the question of, you know, having very small space for playground, but then having more space for residential construction, that's design. So you have to find your ways out. So even the budget is low and then the, the technology is low, I think there's always a solution. That's what the whole process is about. Yeah, and, and in the end, I think that it's very important to have this ecology, uh, the ecology of the temporary spaces that they have in them, and they happen and they are like that. The space which becomes finally a permanent space, and then it's up, or is upgraded over time, slowly, or, or sometimes is a vision of Noguchi, that builds up this amazing space without no participation except for his own creative minds. And, and then it's amazing. I mean, there's so many different ways and these ways, they are all valid. They're all valid. As far as we don't want to impose things to people, they are all valid. There's a, there's a school designer named Roseanne Bosch who practices in Scandinavia that I 
interviewed for my book, and she makes these schools that are sort of like playgrounds because um, they have this this furniture that's like mountains and like valleys rather than desks and chairs. Um, and she says that you know design is there to keep the grass from springing back up. She feels like people bring her in and they say they want change. They, you know, she's bringing in the wind of change and the, the grass folds down, but if she doesn't make a permanent intervention there, it will spring back up and things will go back to the way they were before. And I find that to be a very useful concept, you know, not just in schools, but for all of this sort of playground work and city work that we've been talking about. Because um, design means money is spent. It means like some idea has been agreed upon and, and there's a fixed object and people do respect objects. Okay, we have the last question. I'm a, I'm a teacher actually, so I want to talk as a teacher from our point of view. Uh, the thing is, uh, we talk about Netherlands and examples. When I was studying in University, I saw Emilia Park, there was really a high slide and children can climb up first, there, there's no ladder to go up. And then they should climb up and then they can slide down. And it was really nice for me. It was really, uh, it was my first time, I saw something really creative and blah, blah. But then I start to work. And then we went to American Park as a field trip. So I want to let children to play there. But the thing is, as a teacher, you cannot take risk. And also as Turkish parents, most of them, they don't want to let their uh, I mean, children to play there because it's kind of dangerous for them. I'm not blaming, actually sometimes dangerous because these children are most spending their time in the houses, not uh, in nature or not somewhere else. So they don't have so much chances to play in that areas. For example, when I think about it, opening uh, schools' backyards, the thing is, you, I'm sure you, you can create really nice uh, things for playgrounds, but the important part is um, we should appreciate these creative ideas. Like, if somebody doesn't let you to play in that playground, for example, Ms. Mr. Bliss said, if adults let children to play there, I'm sure they will play, but in Turkey, we cannot let them to play. That's the thing. And sometimes respect is important. For example, my, my dad is a, a principal in a school, and it's a public school, and they should raise a fund to um, repair the football field. They repair, they, they made really nice place, area, playground for backyard, but then after two weeks, it was Again, the door was broken, the backyard was really a mess, big mess. And then the thing is, if you use places, I guess uh, maybe we shouldn't think about playground somewhere, but we can think about somewhere children can easily play in the, in the streets. Like, I don't know, I'm thinking one climbing frame stick to the building, apartment building, and this child can climb there in their street. But it shouldn't be a big playground. Because in Istanbul, it's really difficult for Shishti. We should go to Machka Park, but there are many hills. But Netherlands, you can push your stroller easily in Netherlands. Uh, no, that's the reality, actually, we are observing. Maybe you can talk a little bit about how things change or are evolved over time. Sorry, it's, it was really long, sorry. <laughs> It's about risk. I don't know if you have seen uh, uh, Tim's explanation. Risk is actually part of playing because if you cannot learn how to deal with risk, you will encounter many risks when you're grown up. I do understand your situation as a teacher because then if, if a child comes home with a, with a bruise or a scratch, you are being held responsible where actually you can learn through, uh, to, if you hurt yourself, you know that you weren't capable of doing that yet. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a problem that I cannot solve. Uh, from my perspective, I would say, still, I, we would like to make these places where you at least can encounter that risk and uh, try to explore that by yourself. 
not guided by your parents. I, I go around the world and I notice that the world's getting more secure, actually, practically everywhere. Not everywhere, but, but in many places. And we feel more insecure. We start to become more protective in many, many, from many, many different um, uh, perspectives. And this is actually what you are saying. Uh, the parents don't feel secure. Um, it's something I don't have a solution for, but I also don't want to give a solution for, uh, except for that they maybe should change their mindset as well. And this doesn't come overnight. This is something that they need to learn. Uh, I always give the example, we go back to Amsterdam and Copenhagen. In Denmark, they have their strollers outside, leaving their uh, babies in there, even at being from the Netherlands, we don't believe that. Uh, we think that is very, very risky. So there's always cultural differences uh, between many countries, but uh, maybe this audience is the one that advocates that we need to change that also in Turkey, because children will love it. I'm, I'm not judging actually, I'm just saying I've been listening for a long time, uh, so I'm just thinking as a teacher, I really think that children should jump everywhere, they should play, I'm not the one really scared of taking risks, but okay. the thing is, it's the conditions, so I'm just saying maybe uh, we really like to listen to you and then we really like to have creative designs in our playground, they are really boring for children, I, I know that we can see that. But there well, are some differences. Thank you, and I want to thank you for amazing collaboration.